um, Finn Lagan on the beautiful island of Isla, the Queen of the Hebrides, with her, the Paps of Jura, um, a very potent, or should I perhaps say maternal, uh, backdrop to the site. Now, through the excavations, um, I have been um, guilty, along with lots of others, of um, creating this image of a very powerful uh, lordship, Celtic lordship, in the Isles, throughout the Hebrides, the west of Scotland, in the medieval period, particularly the 14th and 15th century. Uh, the lordship of the Isles, the Macdonalds, um, who deliberately went about creating an alternative uh, model of life, um, very much perhaps uh, similar to what was happening in uh, native Ireland at the same time. Uh, it appears that the, the lords of the Isles did see themselves where were trying to reinvent themselves as uh, Celtic, if you like, Celtic kings. Uh, that is, is one of the strands that has come out in, in work over the last few years. So it's not perhaps surprising that uh, we, we are also aware of traditions of inaugurations of these lords. And in the past, I, I've tended to um, perhaps dismiss them as being just something which uh, the McDonald's were inventing for themselves, reinventing from the 14th century onwards. They were determined to, to make this claim to, to kingship and they recognized that um, if you wanted to be a king, you had to go through various processes, be given white sticks, wave a sword around, have monumental piss-ups, um, have stones with footprints and so on. So what I wanted to do uh, this morning was just review what exactly the evidence is for inauguration or other ceremonies taking place at Finlagan. What we describe as Finlagan is two islands in an inland loch. Um, the smaller island there, Aileen Nacorley, the council island, and the larger island now called Aileen Moor, the large island. Finlagan is a modern name, incidentally. Um, it, it only came into use, I think, in the 1860s. Um, it appears that the place was known in the medieval period as the island of St. Finlugan, um, a character who's mentioned in Adamnan's uh, History of Clumba. Um, and indeed, the, the excavations we carried out on the island uh, do give the suggestion that um, the site may well have um, been monastic in origins, with the smaller island being some uh, lordship centre. We've certainly got early graves and other um, early structures which could uh, suggest monastic presence going back to the 7th century. In the 15th century, when the uh, Lordship of the Isles was um, at its most dominant, its most powerful, um, we appear to have uh, a settlement um, which was not um, a castle, it did not have fortification walls, it perhaps has certain what you might call proto uh, urban characteristics about it, um, a whole series of houses of various sorts, residence, workshops, kitchens, the main building on the site being um, a great hall, a great feasting hall, um, and a smaller island occupied by uh, three buildings, including one which is clearly um, the council chamber, uh, which is mentioned in 16th century sources. Unfortunately, we were not the first to excavate the said uh, council chamber. Um, our Victorian uh, predecessors had very carefully and cleverly removed all the uh, deposits from within it, such as life. Um, I would say this uh, tremendous um, reconstruction by David Simon uh, is not fantasy. It is pretty closely uh, based on uh, the evidence from quite extensive excavations. And it shows um, how the site looked, as I say, in, in the 15th century. Uh, not a site which was permanently occupied, but a site which was um, visited on occasions by the lords and their entourage. And insofar as we, we, we have just a miserable handful of documents, there is a suggestion from them, from the dates on these documents, that they particularly visited in the middle of the summer. So, what's the evidence for um, inaugurations? 
Well, uh, the early source is, in fact, um, 17th century, uh, a clan history, um, which uh, describes the process. Um, and it particularly describes how there was a, a square stone um, with the tract of a man's foot cut thereon, upon which the, 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 the man who was going to be proclaimed Lord stood, denoting that he should walk in the footsteps and uprightness of his predecessors, and that he was installed by right in his possessions. He was clothed in a white habit, um, and um, he received a white rod in his hand, um, and he received his forefather's sword, or some other sword, and so on. Uh, you know, all fairly familiar uh, stuff to, to, to you people in the audience and from what you've heard for, about other uh, inauguration ceremonies. Um, and that is our source of information, what, what happened at Finlagen. The, the stone with the footprint in it, um, it cannot be traced. We don't know if it was a living rock or an actual separate piece of stone. There's been various ingenious attempts over the years by the natives to, to find the said stone. I was taken off on various occasions to the woods round about Finlagen to be shown some miserable um, crack in a rock or, or depression. Um, one of the more um, the ones that a lot of locals want to believe in is this uh, 15th century grave slab, which has on the back of it a very curious depression about foot size, but for me not at all convincing. Footprints really should look like um, footprints, methinks. Disappointingly late to this source, but you know, the sort of detail shows knowledge and an understanding and uh, accounts something which one might think was likely. Now, um, the Scottish historian Steve Boardman, um, whom a great deal of respect, has pointed out that uh, the description in the document I've just shown you does not specifically uh, say that the said inauguration ceremonies took place at Finlagen, though I think that that's perhaps been a wee bit precious because it's, I think it's reasonably clear from the context that that is what's understood. But nevertheless, um, the only account we do have of an inauguration ceremony uh, for a Lord of the Isles uh, described it taking place in another island, uh, the island of Egg in 1386. Um, and one might suggest that the reason for that is that there was clearly a debate in the Lordship at that time as to who would succeed and which direction the Lordship was going. Were the Lords going to sort of um, plough their own furrow in terms of being a sort of separate Celtic entity at enmity with the, uh, the Stuart dynasty, or were they going to try and integrate with the, the Greater Scotland, one might argue. And um, what happened was that um, one half-brother, uh, Ranald, um, he has a portrait of him on his cross, um, um, ended up being responsible for inaugurating his half-brother, Donald, um, about 1386. And um, Egg was very much in Ranald's territory, so maybe this was a sort of um, a, a compromise sort of situation. So um, we ourselves um, were not uh, backward in trying to find uh, footprints or, or other stones that might be involved in inaugurations. And um, while we were excavating, remarkably, um, one sunny evening, um, we did find a rather remarkable uh, boulder uh, on the Loch Edge, um, just adjacent to the two islands, um, local rock. Um, and you can see that the, the shoreline there has got quite a lot of uh, large boulders on it. But the one in question, which I, I pointed out in green, is a reasonably rectangular slab about the sort of size that one might want to sit on. And it has got this very curious inscription on it, A1, uh, in quite authentic looking um, medieval style. And it's very difficult uh, to fault it. And for reasons I'll explain in a couple of minutes, um, one is tempted, perhaps, to suggest that A1 uh, stands for um, a MacDonald ancestor, a MacDonald, one of the early, in fact, the earliest MacDonald, um, if you like, uh, Angus Moore, uh, one of the leaders of the um, Norwegian invasion fleet in 1263, and a scourge of uh, much of Ireland. Um, 
what we had really thought we were going to find, um, perhaps, was a stone which didn't have A1 on it, but which had A2 on it. <laughs> Um, which was described by the Welsh uh, travel writer Thomas Pennant when he visited uh, Finlagan in 1774. And when we found the stone with A1 on it, we thought, oh, well, clearly a misprint in Pennant's book, you know, because you don't get more than one stone, You're clearly nonsense. Uh, but we did find uh, a bit later um, what Pennant was talking about. Um, this stone, we don't know its size or shape because it's, it's normally sunk in the water. Um, the, the, the main island is, is just behind the rather young looking me there. Um, so we don't know the size or shape on it. And it's got these very curious, very crude markings on it. And you can see why it was interpreted as A2. Um, and it was Pennant who was um, told that this A2 stood for basically Angus Og. Uh, a later MacDonald, the one who was the supporter of uh, Robert Bruce and fought at Bannockburn. Um, the stone itself is, is clearly um, set in the remains of a little uh, pier in the water of unknown date, so not in situ. So back in 2003, I um, rather wickedly commented on these stones and said, well, you know, they're clearly something to do with inauguration. Perhaps these really are uh, thrones in the sense that we've, we've heard of uh, this morning. Um, but maybe what we're dealing with is a situation, which could be the same at Schoon, of course, but um, the actual stone um, that was used in inauguration ceremonies was not really of any importance. What really mattered was that the royal butt was placed on a stone, and if the previous stone had got cracked in the piss up after the previous inauguration ceremony, or the, the new king was a different size, what you did was you got another stone. And you know, perhaps at Finlagan you had this tradition that, uh, that you then put your initials on the one that had been used, and you left them lying around. Now, I expected that this would be greeted as nonsense. It probably is, but nobody's told me that. So I'm just telling you again, <laughs> tell me it's nonsense or come up with an argument why it is, OK? This stone, however, I, I have to say that when you look at the, 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 the crudity of the markings on it, um, one does wonder about other things. I believe it is the case in, in Ireland that there are um, uh, stones, or cro there's a cross basic kells, am I right in saying? which has got uh, markings on it, which might suggest it was a boundary marker in some way. And of course, this part of the loch was, was where um, the, the bodyguard um, of the Lords of the Isles are alleged to have camped out. One even wonders whether these are just you know, people you know, sharpening their, 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 their knives or their uh, swords uh, ready for use. I'm just trailing through a lot of, um, you know, sort of, as it were, um, um, grasping at straws for, you know, to build up this, this picture of inaugurations and other ceremonies at, at Finlagen. And one of the other things that, that, that has struck me is that um, there is an old defunct farm, which I think um, called Lake Carlin. Uh, that's a version of it uh, written down by um, an English speaker. Um, so, I mean, it's not lake in, in the Scottish sense of low or lower. Um, I do wonder if, in fact, that really is lek in the, the Gaelic Irish sense of being a stone, and that perhaps uh, one's uh, looking at an old farm, which was Carlin's stone, or perhaps uh, the stone of the old woman. Um, I, I think I'd really like if some place name experts could uh, give this much more attention. There's a whole, an early field system, uh, I've pointed out there and circled it in red, which to me looks like a, a medieval or earlier field system, which probably represents uh, this farm. And generally, where these stones, which I've just talked about, are, and where the, the bodyguards would have camped out uh, next to the site. And then there's the mound. Um, which um, is, is not really commented on in early sources, but um, is a very prominent, uh, regular shaped natural mound, which I've circled there, and you can see is right adjacent to the, the two islands. Um, 
and there are also other standing stones in that landscape. There's one uh, still adjacent to the mound. There were others which were seen uh, by writers in the 17th century, and indeed there's another standing stone at the end of the loch. And some geophysics that were carried out um, by the time team when we were excavating there suggest uh, the presence of quite a number of other prehistoric features round about there. We have a sense that, um, that this landscape, which in Hebridean terms is very, very fertile, um, clearly had quite a lot of um, remains of, of, prehistoric, of a prehistoric nature in it, which would have been recognised by uh, people in the past. Now, um, the mound itself, Kershenda, uh, which I think approximately means uh, the old mound, um, is clearly uh, natural. Uh, it's a big lump of uh, limestone. But in the top of it, um, there were, uh, and that's a standing stone, incidentally, that's next to it. The, the mound itself is just behind the visitor centre that you can see in the shot there. It's partly obscured by. Um, in the top of the mound itself, um, there is evidence for uh, earlier activity. Um, uh, uh, quite a, a, a long banana-shaped trench lined with stones. Um, I don't think we can identify it really as a souterrain. It, it appears to have been a grave. And centrally placed uh, a little Bronze Age uh, curb cairn um, with a cremation in it. And both of these monuments had been clearly uh, trashed in the, in, in the past. They'd been dug into. I, and I, I don't think this is altogether fanciful. I would suggest to you that, in fact, uh, it's possible that when, before the, the, the cairn was dug into, it might have, it was quite centrally placed on top of the mound, it might have given the mound, um, it might have made it look a bit like there was a nipple on top of the mound. Okay? Uh, it's just a suggestion for you. The old place, um, interestingly, um, the traditions on Isla about it in more recent times are that it was the, the grave of Princess Mary, uh, the daughter of um, Robert, King Robert II, who was married to um, uh, John the First Lord of the Isles in the, in the 14th century. Um, there's another curious uh, thing on Isla, I don't know where that it occurs elsewhere. Um, a lot of the place names are, um, are Gallic, um, or indeed Gallicized versions of uh, Scandinavian names is, is more common. But not on the maps. There's a whole series of parallel English names, which a lot of the locals know, know about. And in the 19th century, this place was known as Tomb. It's, it's, but I say not in any maps anywhere. So, um, Clearly, there were things in the landscape which were obvious to people, which were identified as having a ritual uh, importance, and one even wonders whether there might have been a feeling that you know you had there the the um, the, um, the the graves of the ancestors. The other thing I would say about uh, the mound, incidentally, where the sheep are, there's a beautiful sort of platform, a bit like a football pitch, and it's just the sort of place where one could imagine uh, people standing around for uh, particular ceremonies. There's no mention of mounds in any inaugurations or meetings or anything like that. Okay, it's just a bit of, of fantasy on my part. Another aspect of the site which um, I think Barbara Crawford uh, commented on some time ago is um, its remarkable resemblance to uh, some Ting sites, like particular, particularly Ting Wall in Shetland. And of course um, the McDonald's antecedents are, and, and a lot of the um, the background of the island is Scandinavian. Uh, there is indeed quite a, a, a likely Ting site elsewhere in the island, a, a Ting name. Um, but, you know, if we were looking for um, an important Ting site, um, Finnmagen looks the biz. It, it has that sort of appearance um, about it. And that gets us round to one of the other interesting bits of documentary evidence for the place. Um, the account by the Dean of the Isles in 1549 about how um, the Council of the Lords of the Isles uh, met at Finn Lagan. And incidentally, what the text actually says is um, met even though the Lord of the Isles was uh, at his hunting. Um, 
clearly Finlagen was a place, a, a, an important central place for hunting. Uh, we've got uh, hunting arrowheads from the, from the site. And although this is called the Council of the Isles, um, it, it, the, the, the text there, in those texts of 1549, describes who were the councillors and so on, and how they came from different um, clans, if you like, and different parts of the, of the, of the lordship, and how they had different uh, other functions as, as officers in the, um, in the lordship. Um, it's not a council in the sense of a great lord uh, leaning on his mother-in-law, his neighbours and his kids to witness charters. This is, I think, what one really has to describe as, as a real parliament, something that could meet without the lord and something which wasn't dependent just on his, on his own relatives. In archaeological uh, terms, incidentally, um, and, you know, for, for school and everywhere else, you know, you ain't going to find any other documents. Uh, there's got to be an archaeological way forward in this. Uh, the evidence of the importance of, um, of this place as a meeting place where, where laws were decided on, justice given out, and people, you know, did business, is the recovery from the excavations of quite a number of little casket keys and mounts from caskets. And I think the significance of that is that the caskets, which also appear in, in, in representations on sculpture, is that they were document, uh, they were for carrying documents. So that, you know, th th this is just a, a, a throwaway example, if you like, of the sort of what archaeology might do when you're looking at these other sites. Um, it's evidence of, of, of a sort. And we need to come up with strategies for um, what other archaeological evidence uh, we should be looking for and, and how to interpret it. Clearly, the, the, the meetings took place on the council island. Um, there was a council chamber there. Um, the assumption um, um, first uh, put forward by manx based scholars is that what we're dealing with here is a breakaway from the from Tin Wall. That uh, when the uh, Kingdom of the Isles uh, broke up, um, the, um, the 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 people, the, the leaders from the Isles who would have gone to Tin Wall, started meeting that. In Lagan. Disappointingly, there's no mention uh, by Monroe of uh, inauguration ceremonies, but, but, but for him, presumably, that was maybe just something everybody knew about, was, was something not really particularly worth drawing attention to when you could talk about important things like uh, council meetings. And that gets us back to the Kingdom of the Isles, which uh, Andrew was um, talking about um, yesterday. Um, and here it is, and incidentally, this is a plug time. Um, this is the, the book that uh, uh, was being referred to. Um, I've got various leaflets about it, and uh, everything you want to know, or a lot about what you, you might want to know about the Kingdom of the Isles, is uh, accounted in there in uh, various papers. It's not just about the Lewis Chessman. And um, it makes a splendid uh, Christmas present for all your friends and relatives, I might say, too. <laughs> Um, the Kingdom of the Isles, anyway. So, um, and the, the 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 way it's been described up to now is that um, with its main centre um, in the Isle of Man, um, some of the main monuments there, the base of the of the kings, who sometimes called themselves the Kings of Man, sometimes the Kings of the Isles, and sometimes both. And the way the story has developed over the years, particularly amongst uh, Scottish-based uh, historians, and that has to be one of the most splendid uh, portraits uh, of a Scottish hero that's ever been done, very underrated and no doubt strictly accurate. Um, the, 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 the rhetoric amongst our Scottish historians is that um, in the uh, 12th century, um, 1156, uh, there was a big division uh, in the Kingdom of the Isles as a result of um, a fight between Somerled, an Argyle-based uh, prince, and uh, the, the uh, descendants of uh, Godred Croven, based on the Isle of Man. And as a result of a, of a sea battle um, in the dark in January... Really? <laughs> I think... Mean, 
never mind, we'll leave that one. Um, the kingdom uh, was divided um, basically into two, and that shows how it was done with Isla uh, belonging to Summerled and his various descendants, the McSorleys, including the McDonald's. The McDonald's being the, the strongest, you know, um, um, kindred that came through and became lords of the Isles. Um, now, this is not the place to go on and on about this, but I just make the point, um, to a large extent, uh, this is fantasy. It may well be true, but there's absolutely no basis in fact for it. Um, and we need to treat it with a bit more caution than um, uh, generations of historians have done. Um, and, but it has coloured um, the way that we have looked at so much uh, of this part of the world. So that um, everything on Isla and Finlagen has got to do with the McDonald's um, and uh, the descendants of Summerled. I would point out, however, that one of the main uh, characters in the development of the Kingdom of the Isles, the man who usurped uh, the kingdom uh, in 1079, although he was he was a member of, 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 of the ruling family, the family that had ruled up to up till then. Um, his associations are with Isla. Um, Dun Guri there, um, a remarkable looking fort, which um, if it was in Ireland would be a ring fort, but we don't have ring forts in Scotland, so it's something different, I suppose. And what looks like the foundations of a big hall in the, in the centre of it, incidentally. Um, that may or may not be associated with him. He is said in the, in the Chronicle of the Kings of Man to have died in Isla, and local tradition has him been buried at the caravan there. There are other traditions and, and places uh, associated uh, with him on Isla. When one looks at the, um, that the, the, the McSorleys, the McDougals, the McDonalds, and these other people, and what they were up to, whether they were in uh, independent kingdoms or whether they were, you know, just sort of unruly subjects or the kings and man or whatever was happening. Um, what one's looking at is, is the building of castles um, by the sea. Castles which um, clearly have provision for uh, ships and harbours. Here are two good examples, uh, Danuvig on Isla which if one was looking for a home for Summerled, that'd be quite a good place. Anaris, perhaps a bit later, on the island of Mull, with, uh, with a very nice example of a harbour. A lot of the, um, well, it's not a lot, lordship uh, centres which are, are associated with um, the, the, the kings of, um, descended from Godred Croven, uh, tend not to be castles and tend not necessarily to be by the seaside. And one of the classic examples of that is Finlagen itself. Finlagen, um, for a lordship which was a thalassocracy, that's about right, isn't it, um, is, is remarkable for being inland. It's also remarkable that um, in the 13th century, Finlagen was in fact um, a castle, but something rather different from what we see McSorley's uh, building elsewhere, um, or indeed in um, other related families, uh, native families in Ireland perhaps. It was clearly a big sort of um, castle on a European model with a small island um, with a large keep on it, perhaps rather similar uh, to the keep which um, the, um, the kings of the Goddard Croven line were bu building at Russian in the Isle of Man, or perhaps similar to the keep at um, 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 Carrick Fergus in, in Ireland. It didn't survive all that long because it was um, structurally on very unsure foundations. It was built over the remains of a dune, built over the remains of a Cranach, not a very clever trick. But the point is that Finlagen does look very different from what we know um, Summerled and his descendants were building elsewhere. So I think we've got to rethink, you know, this this story of of um, of the origins of Finlagen as a centre of power. But just to finish, I would draw yourself to uh, draw attention to something else which uh, may or may not be significant. And at this point, I'm about to lose any friends I've got in the Isle of Man. I suspect um, the text um, by Dean Munro describing council meetings at Finlagen 
says that the meetings were um, used the laws promulgated by Ranald, the son of Somerled, i.e. laws dating back to the 12th century. And that makes, on a very rough and ready reckoning, uh, evidence for Finlagen as uh, an assembly place earlier than Tinwall. The Tinwall was it really a transplant of what had been happening up in Isla. Thank you very much.